series presentation. Our speaker today uh, is Professor Willow Longamam, Associate Professor at the Urban Studies and Planning Department and Director of Community Development at the National Center for Smart Growth Research and Education at the University of Maryland College Park. My name is Carolyn Swope. I'm a PhD student here in Columbia's Urban Planning Program, and I will be moderating the session. I will just start with a few brief technical and logistical announcements and then turn to introducing our speaker. During the talk, I'd like to remind audience members on Zoom to please mute their microphones. We will be recording today's lecture, so anyone in the audience who wishes to not be recorded should turn off their video input. Audience and Avery 115, if you happen to also be connected on Zoom, please be mindful to mute your sound as well. The chat box should be used only for discussion regarding the session. If you have technical questions that apply only to you, please message me or my co-host Ranjani and Helena privately. We encourage all of you to type your questions into the chat box during the presentation. After the presentation, we will have time for Q&A. We'll start Q&A around 2 or 2.15 p.m. Uh, so that we have time for your questions. I will be coordinating the Q&A with attention to diversity and inclusion. So if you have already had a chance to ask a question, please allow others to do so before asking another one. To ask questions, participants can use the raise your hand feature and we'll call on you to unmute and ask your question directly. Or you may also type your questions into the chat box and I can read them out. For the audience in Avery 114, you can just raise your hand and I will call on you to ask your question directly. So with that, I'm delighted to introduce today's speaker. Willow Longamam, PhD, is Associate Professor of Urban Studies and Planning and Director of Community Development at the National Center for Smart Growth Research and Education at the University of Maryland College Park. Her scholarship focuses on how urban and suburban policies and plans contribute to and can address social inequality, particularly in neighborhoods undergoing rapid racial and economic change. She has written extensively on suburban policy, racial segregation, immigration, gentrification, redevelopment policies, and neighborhood opportunity. Her research has appeared in various journals, such as the Journal of Urban Affairs and Journal of Planning Education and Research, books, and popular media outlets, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Baltimore Sun, NPR, New Republic, Bloomberg City Lab, and Al Jazeera. She is the author of Trespassers, Asian Americans and the Battle for Suburbia, as well as a forthcoming book on redevelopment politics and equitable development organizing in the Washington DC suburbs. Dr. Longamam is also a non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute's Metropolitan Housing and Communities Policy Center and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution's Governance Studies Program. Her talk today is entitled Somos de Langley Park, the fight for fair to redevelopment along Maryland's Purple Line. So Professor, if you're ready, I will turn things over to you now. Wonderful, thank you, Carolyn. Um, and thank you to the students for inviting me. It is a particular honor to be invited by students um, and especially students who I know at Columbia have been forging such important battles um, over um, labor rights on campus. This talk was supposed to take place a little sooner than it was, but I am happy um, that to stand in solidarity with the students um, in their ongoing fight. Um, so kudos to you, um, and it is an honor and a pleasure to be here. My talk today is going to focus on a larger project that Carolyn just described that I've been working on, looking at um, the intersection around suburbanization of poverty and redevelopment in the DC suburbs, and really trying to displace many of our discourses about gentrification that really focus on center city environments outside of that context to ask why it matters um, that gentrification is also happening in our suburbs and how communities and organizers respond to those new challenges that we're seeing. So that is the context for my presentation and I look forward to um, hopefully a robust discussion at the end uh, with students about this work. So I'll go ahead and share screen here. All right, so here we go. 
Um, so again, the, the type talk um, for the presentation is so must stay Langley Park. Um, Langley Park is the community that I'm, I've been working in for several years as part of this book project. Um, and um, it is also the site of a new uh, light rail line known as the Purple Line. But the context for this work in the larger book project of which it is a part um, is thinking about the intersection of some important trends that we're seeing. Once commonly thought to be the sole province of white middle class and elites, for the past couple of decades, we've seen that many suburbs of major metropolitan areas have become home to the majority of racial and ethnic minorities, immigrants, and people living in poverty. And this is a profound departure from the kind of central city white flight that shaped the 20th century metropolis. And now we're seeing that young professionals and aging baby boomers have been moving back into urban neighborhoods at unprecedented levels that are displacing many of the manufactured and racialized poverty that was concentrated within them. And then meanwhile, we're seeing that racial and economic diverse suburbs have experienced these huge population booms um, and gains that are even larger than in central cities and, and predominantly white suburbs. So here, what I'm showing you is a map of the Washington DC area which is roughly this um, triangle area that you see here. And you see that in 1980, um, this is a look at uh, race by, I'm sorry, poverty, our families living in poverty by race. And you see that in 1980, it is concentrated inside the borders of Washington, DC, but by 2010, it is much more dispersed and diverse um, in terms of who is making up um, those families living in poverty and where they live. Um, and the community that we're gonna be talking about today, known as Langley Park and the larger international corridor is located here. It is predominantly a Latinx um, community um, just outside of the borders of Washington, DC. But what we've also seen is that suburbia's rising tide of social and economic diversity has been met by a rapid transformation of its built environment. While the late 20th century was characterized by low density development that had developed large swaths of land into single family homes and strip malls and parking lots, the new mantra for good suburban development calls for more walkable, dense, mixed use communities, especially near transit. So in practice, these principles have led to new trends in smart growth, new urbanism, transit oriented development, and suburban retrofitting that's really reshaping the spatial landscape of suburbia. So suburbia's, suburbia's urban rise has been lauded by many urbanists that have long derided the economic efficiency, aesthetic, um, pleasing uh, aesthetics of suburbia and its environmentally and socially destructive forms of development. Um, but what we know is actually that there's been dense development in suburbs for a long time and that suburbs are becoming more dense as they become more urban-like. So here I have a map of um, density um, by census tract in the Washington DC region. And what it shows you is that we're, if we're just trying to classify urban typologies by density, it's really hard to categorize what is urban and suburban uh, strictly along municipal lines. And so the dark blue um, would what we be classically called as an urban density versus the light blue, which is a suburban density. Um, and many of the, actually all three of my case study communities um, for the larger book project are located in these um, dense suburban cores that are becoming even more dense um, with many of the trends that I just described. Many suburban redevelopment proponents have, however, by and large, elided the questions about the social con consequences of these trends. What we've seen is that historic patterns in black and brown suburban settlement and unprecedented recent migrations, um, particularly those living in poverty, has raised concerns about the changes in suburbia's built environment. Well, presumably some of these marginalized groups might benefit from more compact suburban neighborhoods, they also often rightfully fear the impacts of large scale redevelopment. Projects that to many urban planners and policymakers 
We may see as needed investments in underdeveloped neighborhoods, they're often experienced by affected communities as a recipe for displacement that spurs heated backlash and debate. Here, I'm showing you some maps of um, what might be called gentrification maps. These are people who take various indicators of um, gentrification and communities and try to map those communities that are gentrified, that are eligible, eligible to gentrify, um, and who's being affected by those. Um, the first map is um, from the National Community Reinvestment Coalition that in 2010 um, found um, Washington DC to be the most gentrified community in the United States. And it's showing that while most of that, um, those communities that were being impacted were in the center city core, those areas that had the highest rates of black poverty in the 1980 map that I showed you. Um, we also have many communities outside of the Washington DC core that have gentrified or eligible to gentrify. I'm, I'm not gonna get into a measuring debate right now, but if you take different measurements of gentrification, you get different results. The map on the left, I'm sorry, the right is showing um, the uh, map that one of my students did using a different methodology um, and just still showing that we're seeing that there are a number of gentrified communities outside of the DC core. So the Right to Suburbia, this larger book project is investigating the battles that have been waged primarily by Black and Latinx communities in the Washington DC suburbs over the uneven costs and benefits of redevelopment. So in three case study neighborhoods um, that have recently or are currently undergoing a suburban renaissance, it asks how those most likely to bear the weight of suburbia's transformation to its good urban form have tried to balance the scales. How have the, the processes and products of suburban redevelopment disadvantaged, already disadvantaged groups? And how have these groups mobilized to assert a more equitable stake in the, and place in their suburban futures. So the three case study communities um, that I work in are located in Silver Spring, um, just outside of the DC and Northwest border and inner ring suburb um, that was one of the early sites of re redevelopment um, and where some of the um, questions about equitable redevelopment first came to the fore in the Maryland suburbs. My second community is the Wheat, uh, community of Wheaton, Maryland, where some of the policies that were ad adapted um, in Silver Spring and that were fairly ineffective in helping small businesses to remain in place became a much more effective um, tool that organizers use um, to help many of the businesses in this community remain. And then my final case study that I'm going to talk about today is in, in the International Corridor, where many of the groups that came together in Silver Spring and Wheaton um, are still fighting um, for more equitable redevelopment along the international corridor as a new light rail line is currently being built in that community. The larger point of this project is to illustrate how this new urban renewal um, does not fit very tightly within our urban bounds. Similar processes are also at work in suburbs that are producing and reproducing patterns of uneven racialized development. The new sub suburban renewal has not been an, an simply adding a prefix onto an old concept. With the new cast of characters and spatial dynamics at play, suburbia has reshaped urban redevelopment processes and politics. So I'm arguing that suburbia's brand or unique brand of redevelopment has added to rather than alleviated many Black and Latin, Latinx communities' challenges in claiming their right to remain in suburbia. And I talk about the kind of challenges um, that are unique to suburbia's um, spatial form and social and political construction. Um, so it's private, consolidated and privatized land uses that have made redevelopment projects especially disruptive. It's political fragmentation and increasing segregation and the scale of um, the redevelopment that's tending to isolate communities 
and render the struggles of one community invisible or unconnected to the other. I talk about the institutional struggles of, of um, suburbs that often lack the high capacity established nonprofits and advocacy organizations that many cities have that can effectively engage residents in sustained redevelopment battles and how organizing coalition um, building is further challenged by suburbia's changing composition. Compared to their urban counterparts, gentrifying suburbs tend to have more diverse residents dispersed across larger areas where you have Black and Latinx residents and particularly immigrants that have lacked a long-term presence in established organizing platforms. They hold less political power and representation um, that have been that has, which has been built over decades of struggle in central cities. And re when redevelopment arrives, many residents in these neighborhoods that were originally designed to exclude them face a, a real uphill battle in trying to build the politics and policies that they need to stay in place. They often confront a dearth of effective anti-displacement policies and a lack of political will and the financial capital needed to create them. But just as marginalized groups have always done in American cities, they are fighting back in suburbs. And so part of my um, work is to document how equitable development organizing has effectively taken place in suburbs in one of the, um, in, and one of the most rapidly gentrifying metropolitan regions in the United States. It tells the tale of these grassroots activists, um, community groups, and political leaders who are mobilizing um, for the right of residents and small businesses to remain and benefit from new development in their communities, and shows how they have brought this needed visibility um, to um, processes of suburban gentrification and built vital institutional capacities, coalitions, political wills and tools to combat the most their most damaging effects. And the struggles of these communities demonstrate that through processes of that though processes of uneven metropolitan de development may shift their fo locus, they rarely go away, at least without a good fight. And here I'm showing the picture of Ferguson just to remind us how important um, and effective suburban organizing can be. Ferguson was one of the first times I think we really saw at a large scale um, suburban, the struggles of black communities in suburbs so prominent um, at the national stage, but also the work of organizers um, at that national scale really taking place and really centered on some of the conditions that were um, important to the Ferguson community and how things like policing had been used at, um, to help to increase the tax base of this struggling suburban community that had experienced white flight over decades as uh, black communities began to move in. So now let's talk about Langley Park and the International Corridor, which um, is the focus of this talk. So by 2022, a 16 mile, $3.3 billion project will become one of the region's first suburban light rail lines. And in doing so, it's going to connect some of Maryland's highest income neighborhoods to some of its most impoverished. This new connection raises many new possibilities for historically disinvested Maryland suburbs. Um, this circumferal, circumferential um, connection will connect to its existing metro lines. Um, it's providing a critical east-west connection um, that doesn't um, currently uh, exist in the metro system. Um, and so unlike many kind of um, transit lines that work in kind of the hub and spokes model that's designed to bring suburban commuters into the downtown, the purple line is really recognizing America's new suburban reality in which many people, um, black, brown, and white communities um, live and work in suburbs, right? So it's creating that critical connection. But in doing so, the line um, show, cuts a diverse transect across our region, highlighting the vast inequalities that we have amongst our suburbs. It, so here in this picture, I show you where the purple line is going to go. 
Here is the purple line at its um, wet, most western point, which is um, connecting in the, in the community of Bethesda, Chevy Chase, and Montgomery County. This is roughly the county line through which it cuts. And these are all suburban, count, um, suburban parts of the Washington, D.C. region. And so what you see here is that the line starts in one of the wealthiest communities in our region with a median household income of 141,000 with a relatively low population density, but a large number of jobs and a small percentage of people that use public transit um, and a relatively small non-white population. And as the purple line continues east, the population density increases, the number of jobs decreases, the median household um, get lower, the number of people that rely on public transit gets higher, and the non-white population goes up. And all this kind of um, peaks at the international corridor, right? Where you have the highest population density, the lowest number of jobs, the lowest median income along the line, and the highest percentage of people that rely on public transit and the highest non-white population. So for Langley Park and the larger international corridor, Langley Park sits on the Prince George's County side, the international corridor, cuts across the county line. This new transit could be um, present a huge opportunity to better connect um, to new jobs in the area more efficiently, um, connect to new opportunities in employment, education, and otherwise, um, increase public transportation for a, a community that really lacks public transportation or efficient public transportation right now. Um, but is extremely reliant on that public transportation. Um, and so for that reason, many people in the Purple Line Corridor Coalition have been um, positive about the um, prospects of the Purple Line, but they've also been very concerned about the prospects of what the building out of the Purple Line may do. Langley Park has a history as, as a white working class neighborhood um, starting in the post-war era, but, uh, and even after that as an African-American neighborhood in the 1970s and 80s. But for the past several decades, it has served as a popular arrival suburb um, for diverse immigrants from Central and South America, the Caribbean, Caribbean Asia, and Africa. Um, today, it's predominantly a Latinx immigrant community and one of the most densely populated communities in Maryland. Um, and this is part of what creates the vulnerability of the neighborhood um, to the impacts of the Purple Line. Of the neighborhood's roughly 21,000 residents, about two thirds are foreign born. About 82% are Latinx, the overwhelming majority of which are recent arrivals from Central America, largely Guatemala and El Salvador. Among non-Hispanics, over half are African-American, including a relatively large West African immigrant population. And the neighborhood has one of the largest concentrations of undocumented um, Latinx immigrants in Prince George's County and some say the state. With residents that are largely migrating for economic opportunity, the neighborhood is disproportionately young and male. As you'll see in these, some of these statistics where I'm comp comparing Langley Park to the larger Prince George's County. The households average about four people, which is over one point higher than the county or the state and often have many related and unrelated individuals that crowd into, a, into its many garden style apartments in order to make the rent. Residents struggle with many of the typical challenges of low income immigrant communities, with low levels of education and English language proficiency. Um, few adults that have high school diplomas or equivalents. Um, the adults often work in low wage, low skilled positions outside of the formal labor market. Many hold intermittent part-time or seasonal jobs with few benefits and often work multiple jobs to make ends meet. Many are employed in construction as day laborers and with others commonly working in retail, healthcare, food services, and waste management. Following the recession, those employed in construction and related sectors had difficulty finding jobs 
um, and the unemployment rate was nearly double that of the state. Poverty rates are high and household incomes are low with nearly half of households earning below the DC metropolitan median, which is relatively high across the United States. Um, and about uh, roughly one in six residents living below the poverty line. And I will say that many of these, um, these numbers in terms of income likely inflate the neighborhood's picture of economic well-being by failing to account for its high undocumented population and households um, that are comprised of several unrelated adults. Compounding these neighborhood vulnerabilities is a lack of quality affordable housing with about four in five households renting one of the neighborhood's 50, roughly 5,200 housing units and over half paying more than 30% of their income on rent, which is, as many of you know, a common indicator of affordability. But despite these challenges, Langley Park is a very strong and connected community. As in many low-income immigrant neighborhoods, residents hold strong social capital and rely on each other for everyday forms of support and assistance, carpooling and childcare. Their tight social networks help to sustain the neighborhood's strong sense of community and the viability of its many small businesses, um, many of which are family run, immigrant owned and local serving. But the Purple Line is poised to radically reshape Langley Park and the larger international corridor. Nearly all of Langley Park's housing and small businesses are located within a half a mile of the neighborhood's two proposed stops, which you can see on this map here. This land use map shows the areas in red, which are the low density commercial areas and the areas in Brown, which are the medium density um, existing garden style apartments. And the red line shows you the current um, sector plan boundary of the neighborhood, which is also the census designated place boundary for Langley Park. So the sector plan, which was adopted in 2009, calls for transit-oriented development to create future hubs of activity around the Purple Line stations and a higher density mixed use and pedestrian friendly environment. And of course, the concerns of Langley Park residents and business owner is displacement. The new transit line offer, um, new transit lines often raise land values, trigger rental increases, taxes and insurance rates, stimulate tenure conversions and lead to a loss of subsidized housing. Rising land values could also raise commercial rents, impacting the viability of many of these local small businesses, many of which already operate on slim margins. With the loss of businesses and residents, neighborhood advocates fear that Langley Park's strong sense of community and its cultural identity can be lost. But of course, as I discussed before, um, the reaction, um, while residents and activists are really concerned about these losses, they're also um, overall have been pretty positive about what the Purple Line could bring to Langley Park. It promises to bridge this important transportation gap and improve access to opportunities and services across the region. Um, this new light rail, fixed rail line um, could um, create opportunities for those who don't own a vehicle, which is about one in four adults in Langley Park. Um, it could help to increase the bicycle and pedestrian amenities in Langley Park. Many people without a car are, can regularly be seen walking around the neighborhood to many of its small businesses or biking um, as a form of commuting. Um, but of course, they can only have these amenities if they are able to stay in the neighborhood. And so many activists have been fighting for this right. Um, in 2009, the Maryland Transit Authority identified the potential path for the Purple Line to include Langley Park in the International Corridor and began holding meetings um, in the neighborhood and across the region about the new line. In some of these early meetings, the residents from the higher income west side communities like the Fez de Chevy Chase 
came out regularly and in large numbers to those meetings. And in contrast, Langley Park residents um, and those throughout much of Prince George's County who stood to bear the brunt of the project's negative impacts were largely at, absent. So advocacy groups began to step in to fill the void. So after several meetings, CASA, um, which is the largest immigrant rights group in the Mid-Atlantic region that has their headquarters in Langley Park, became very concerned about the project's potential impacts. And in 2011, they um, began organizing residents and other small, business, small businesses and grassroots organizations under the banner of a new organization known as the Fair Development Coalition. And you can see their banner here on the photo on the left. This grassroots group is comprised of advocacy organizations from community labor, faith-based groups, educational groups that are all concerned with the impacts of the Purple Line on the international corridor. They aim to ensure that the residents were able to benefit and were not desperately harmed by the Purple Line and believed that the line could be the foundation of a comprehensive community development agenda, but only if the impacts of the line were addressed so that existing residents and small businesses were able to remain. FDC um, received a boost in 2013 when the Purple Line Corridor Coalition was created. The Pur Purple Line Corridor Coalition, their banner is here on the right photo. Um, this is a, a, a grass tops group um, made up of county and state government leaders, developers, civic organizations, foundations, businesses, um, and universities focused up on ensuring active and equitable planning and policymaking across the whole of the Purple Line. This is led by the University of Maryland's National Smart Growth, Cent uh, Smart Growth Research and Education Center where I serve as Director of Community Development. So these two groups, the FDC and the PLCC, have worked to address some of the key planning and political challenges of equitable development across the Purple Line, um, and specifically in Langley Park in the larger international corridor. They've tried to confront the host of conditions and challenges that, um, that create um, and create an equitable development agenda uh, for the neighborhood. But their successes and their challenges highlight some of the, both the promising pathways and likely, stum likely stumbling blocks for um, many suburban equitable development movements. One of their largest victories um, was the 2007 signing, 17 signing of a community development agreement with leaders from both counties and many cities, towns, and nonprofit organizations along the corridor. So that is the picture on the left as you see um, the University of Maryland president as well as the county executives from both Montgomery and Prince George's County um, at the signing event for that um, Pathways to Opportunity document, which is an agreement to several principles um, along the line, including affordable housing preservation and production, supporting small businesses, connecting local workers to job, and creating healthy and vibrant communities. And so while this is a key document to ensuring more equitable development along the line. It also came at the expense of a key loss of the coalitions. So on the, the left-hand side, you see um, then um, Lieutenant Governor um, Anthony Brown, who was running for um, the, the um, he was running for Maryland, governor at the time against Larry Hogan. And he was a key supporter of the, um, what was then known as the Purple Line Community Compact. This would have been a community benefits agreement, a legally binding agreement that was supported by the then governor, Government O'Malley. This was a key document that both the Fair Development Coalition and the Purple Line Corridor um, Coalition have been pressing for a long time that would have held um, both counties to le a legally binding agreement and state agencies to a legally binding agreement that would have really put some legs into some of the goals of what is now the Purple Line Corridor Com 
um, known as the Purple Line Quarter Community Be Benefits Agreement. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but unfortunately, the politics at the time did not allow for that. The governor that was elected was a Republican who touted new roads as a solution to the state's transportation um, challenges. And one of his first acts was to cancel funding for um, a, another light rail line in Baltimore known as the Red Line and to reduce the state funding for the Purple Line. Um, and so the negotiations over this legally binding agreement came to an uh, abrupt halt and the state pulled their support um, for the agreement and many of its terms out altogether. And this just symbolized many of the kinds of challenges um, that were ahead for these coalitions and the kind of work that they were doing. And now I wanna turn to some of the challenges that I think um, still are ahead for these coalitions as they continue um, to work on an equitable development agenda for the, the line that really underscores some of those challenges that I prefaced at the beginning um, about our suburban conditions and how that challenges many of our um, ideas about what equitable development means and how we can work to achieve it. So one, the international corridor spans um, two counties, Mon Montgomery and Prince George's County. But for many Langley Park residents, their sense of community straddles, also straddles this invisible dividing line between the two, two counties and parts of the city of Tacoma Park. But the neighborhood's location at, the multi, at this intersection of multiple jurisdictions compl complicates the challenges of defining what equitable development looks like and the county and county official and advocates ability and willingness to work together towards those goals. Both counties have their own planning and zoning authorities and operate, and while they operate under this common banner um, of the Maryland National Capital Planning Commission, that's supposed to coordinate park and land, and land use planning between the counties, um, that's often a complicated um, challenge. The city of Tacoma Park, in which part of um, Langley Park lies, also has its own city planning department um, as well. Langley Park's um, location in an unincorporated inner ring suburb of uh, Prince George's County also lends itself to a lack of representation and political will. Denny Taveras, who represents this area on the county council, is the only Latinx uh, county council member. Um, most of the others are African-American who represent wealthier outside the Beltway communities with more homeowners, less immigrants, and less poverty. And she's noted that this the county political makeup and Latinx the Latinx community's low rates of political participation has made it particularly difficult for her to get other elected leaders to care about the issues that really affect her constituents. The politics of engagement and representation are further compl um, complicated by Langley Park's location within a fragmented and unequal region. The Washington DC area is racially and economically diverse, but among the most segregated metropolitan areas in the nation. The Eastern half of the area includes, including large parts of Prince George's Car County, carry the burden of poverty and distress, while the Western half, including much of Montgomery County, enjoys the bulk of pros prosperity, jobs, amenities, and high-valued neighborhoods, as we see by looking at that transect of the Purple Line. And while one of the wealthiest African-American counties in the country, Prince George's County has only 60% of the tax base of its neighboring Montgomery County, which ranks amongst the wealthiest counties in the nation. And so early on coordination amongst the counties over the future of Langley Park proved pretty difficult. Langley Park has two sector plans, one in Montgomery County and one for Prince George's County, both named um, the same plan, but with very different goals and very different tools um, at hand to be able to achieve those goals. Um, for instance, Montgomery County is nationally known for having the country's oldest inclusionary zoning program known as the moderately priced dwelling unit, while Prince George's County doesn't have um, an inclusionary zoning program at all. 
So one of the main roles of FDC and PLCC is um, to coordinate interjurisdictional planning and policy making that um, would not otherwise happen amongst these two very different counties. And I think that was well illustrated in the community development agreement that has been signed and that tries to create common goals around those critical areas uh, for um, the two counties. Another primary challenge of working along the purple line, and I think in many suburban communities, is um, protecting and producing quality affordable housing. Um, but this is challenged by um, the large number of apartment complex that are comprised of these market rate or naturally occurring affordable housing units that are typical for many um, dense inner ring suburbs that were built out during the post-war period. About three quarters of the neighborhood's housing stock are rentals um, that are affordable, quote unquote, to low to modern income households in our region, but actually about half of Langley Park um, residents cannot afford them and that, that they pay over 30% of their incomes on rent. Langley Park has no public or subsidized housing projects, um, again, unique to its suburban condition, and only 52 housing vouchers uh, recipients in the neighborhood's primary zip code. Like many other inner ring suburbs, its housing conditions have declined um, rapidly since the end of the post-war period where many of these older apartment um, complexes were built with the median year of construction being 1950. They're dense with an average of 279 units spread across only 13 complexes in the community. The majority of these are owned by a handful of out-of-state companies or their subsidiaries. There's a lot of several large uh, real estate investment trusts um, that own many of these units. Many of them have hazardous environmental conditions inside the units that range from asbestos and lead exposure to frequent complaints about mold, bed bugs, rodents, and faulty electricity and plumbing. In 2018, Langley Park was home to two of the county's quote unquote distressed properties. It's our multifamily properties with multiple and repeated code violations. Um, in addition to its dangerous living conditions, roughly half of Langley Park homes are overcrowded, a rate that's five times higher than the county or the state. Residents pack into um, with many several uh, related and non-related family members and able to, in order to be able to afford the rent um, with occupancy codes, uh, occupancy limits sometimes exceeding county codes. And residents who are undocumented, unwilling to call county and code enforcement um, to report the kind of poor conditions that they're facing inside um, the units. Landlords often take advantage of residents' vulnerable legal status to avoid making repairs with frank, frequent complaints about um, landlord intimidation for calling code enforcement, making maintenance requests, or tenant organizing. Langley Park only has one tenant organization amongst 13 complexes, and this was one that was recently organized by CASA. They frequently complain about leasing practices that require them to pay for basic repairs um, and excessive late fees. Meanwhile, with the purple line um, changing their underlying land uses, rents have continued to rise uh, without any substantial property improvements as speculation about the purple line has heated up. But while Prince George's County could intervene um, and provide more protections, some of the larger politics over um, affordability in the region have complicated this. And we've talked about the lack of um, tools that Prince George's County has to address affordability, as well as the quality of housing. Purple, the Purple Line Corridor Coalition and FDC has really pushed for on a number of these fronts and made some important interventions um, in affordability and uh, quality of housing. Um, some of those include um, the uh, creating of Prince George's County's first housing trust fund and then pushing to get that fund actually funded um, and a new tenants opportunity to purchase act um, which allows tenants to organize 
and be able to purchase buildings on their own in the county. Um, the coalitions have also been central to new housing code enforcement policies that were just passed in the, both counties, in both Montgomery and Prince George's County. They're actively pushing for a new, um, they've, they've created a new affordable housing plan for both, um, for both counties and has gotten both state and private foundations to help fund some of those goals. So they're making real inroads, but they have a lot of challenges ahead. On the small business front, um, the, Prince George, uh, the Purple Line really places new, uh, many new pressures on small businesses that tend to rent space in strip malls that like many other inner ring suburbs serve as affordable spaces for immigrants and people of color to start new enterprises. But with the Purple Line, many um, commercial rents are expected to rise and years of construction um, is disrupting the businesses, parking, visibility, and pedestrian activity. In this process, um, the vibrant culture and economic life and the sense of community that has helped define this neighborhood could be lost. But like many residents, many small businesses are already on the edge. Many of these businesses are immigrant owned and family run. Um, they work with limited cash flow. They cluster in industries that have a low cost of entry, but are very vulnerable to downturns and produce below average returns. They also compete with a number of liquor stores, check cashing facilities and dollar stores that cluster in the neighborhood and advocates say prey on poor people. They tend to rely on foot traffic from local clientele who are themselves vulnerable to displacement. As one of the business owners told me, if residents go away, my business will go bankrupt, as many of these um, serve the needs of the immigrant populations who live nearby. Um, businesses also face lending discrimination, have limited access to capital and credit compared to their white counterparts. They borrow from friends and family or use personal savings in order to launch and grow their businesses. And they struggle to get any number of professional and technical assistance resources um, in order to keep their doors open. They don't have the time and oftentimes other employees to be able to attend trainings or apply for a grant and often lack the language skills, social networks, time and resources in order to do so. Small businesses uh, associations in many areas have uh, helped to fill this gap and advocate for the needs of small businesses, but Langley Park does not have one. And the surrounding um, small business owners associations don't include Langley Park businesses. So they still face the, the rising rents associated with the Purple Line like residents and many of the, the complexes in which they sit are similar to the housing conditions in which they're owned by um, large out-of-state owners um, and many are locked into predatory triple net leases that require them to make significant capital improvements. Prince George's County, again, has limited number of resources to protect small businesses. And in part, this relates to the history of commercial redlining in the area. The county has long claimed that the, the area has been bypassed by major employers and large chains because of racial bias. And instead, um, popular white tablecloth uh, restaurants and entertainment complexes go to the favorite quarters and places like Bethesda Chevy Chase and ignore um, places like Prince George's County, leaving it with an abundance of small, low-valued businesses and a lack of major anchors. And so Prince George's economic development strategy has really centered on trying to attract those larger businesses that have long avoided Prince George's County. PLCC and FDC has done a lot to bridge some of these gaps and create greater protections for small businesses. Um, they have worked with the, the state to um, help to mitigate some of the construction disruption and put in place um, uh, some of the um, open for small businesses and some of the other mitigation efforts that have gone on along the line. They've also received a lot of private funding, including a $5 million uh, grant, recent grant, um, to provide technical assistance and loans to businesses along the corridor. 
and received a grant from the state in order to um, the state's federal transit administration in order to create an economic development for the corridor um, and data, data and monitoring tools um, to monitor the close, closure of small businesses. And one of the final challenges I'd like to talk about is um, building capacity, uh, community capacity for the sustained advocacy that's needed um, in the process as long as redevelopment. So like um, business owners, residents themselves struggle with the time and resources to participate in everyday community events, let alone a decades long transit planning process. In some neighborhoods, the community-based organizations help to fill this gap, but in Langley Park, many of these organizations struggle with the high demands and limited capacity that temper their advocacy. Um, and while PLCC and FDC um, have helped to build their capacity, even these co coalitions have at times struggled to stay afloat um, and wrestled with some of the hard questions about their role in Langley Park. Um, the fear cast a long shadow over many undocumented residents um, and, and their families. And, and when um, thinking about the Purple Line, a range of other barriers frustrate the efforts of um, residents to participate, including language issues. Many of the small business owners we talked about um, just lack the time and resources to be able to participate and navigate local bureaucracies. Many families, both parents work often multiple jobs and in distant locations. And many of the community-based organizations um, that represents resident interest um, focus on providing direct services and have few staff. The neighborhood's lack of organizational capacity is due in part to a legacy of segregation and the results of lack, um, a lack of poverty related services, funding and organizations in suburbs and policy and foundations that have yet to recognize this new suburban reality. This is something that a number of scholars have talked about in terms of um, resources for low income communities and suburbs. Um, and many of the uh, nonprofit service organizations in Langley Park um, started in the city and have established satellite suburban offices um, that has tried to move quickly as um, suburban populations have moved um, in order to meet, reach their needs. But they're struggling to provide services across broad geographical areas um, and not able to quickly pivot in order to do the kind of advocacy that residents and businesses and, and Langley Park require. FDC and, and PLCC have really bolstered the grassroots and grass tops engagement. Um, they've met with political leaders, community residents, um, and business and, pro and property owners in public events um, and to draw up their community development agreement. But they've also helped to spur more grassroots engagements. Um, this picture Right here is one of um, the PLC, um, the Fair Redevelopment Coalition events in which CASA um, sometimes goes around before their meetings and provides shuttle vans to residents to bring them out to planning meetings as many people lack even basic transportation. They've engaged churches, um, which are a major venue for outreach in many suburban communities that otherwise lack um, community-based organizations um, in their coalition and in support of their work on the community development, um, community development agreement. But many suburbs lack such high capacity organizations like CASA that's able to do this work um, and have a dearth of regional foundations as well as uh, federal and state funds in order to, to service the needs of these organizations. So what does this mean for the future of the international corridor? Some of um, the fair redevelopment and um, PLCC's ongoing challenges demonstrate how far the international corridor and the larger region have to go in realizing their equitable development goals. Well, they brought the county leaders and 
uh, across the juris uh, many jurisdictions to the table. They've struggled to align their policies and priorities. They um, gained state support for their work and work with county leaders across inner and outer suburbs. While they've improved both counties' affordable housing toolkits and put forth bold new housing plans, many remain in the counties, many holes remain in the county's affordable housing funding, tools, and capacity, particularly in Prince George's County, which is where Langley Park sits. Given inequalities across the region, many political leaders remain unwilling to invest in the coalition's plan. While serious gaps remain in philanthropic and nonprofit capacity for, to fill them. While providing vital technical assistance to vulnerable small businesses, the coalition have yet to gain support for a more comprehensive um, agenda and resources to protect small businesses. And while increasing community participation and the capacity of local organizations, the coalitions are still struggling with questions about voice, agency, internal politics, and funding that threatens their long-term viability and legitimacy. And meanwhile, the Purple Line is pushing forward. This is um, a picture that I took on my way to a meeting at CASA where the pipes, um, because of construction, had burst in the street and I was sitting in traffic for about an hour trying to make my meeting. Um, and if you can imagine the struggles that I went through just to get to my meeting, um, you can imagine the struggles that small businesses are going through um, with all the disruptions over um, parking and traffic. I now largely avoid going through Langley Park on my way to the University of Maryland. Um, and this is the kind of things that has been happening in Langley Park since it first broke ground uh, since the Purple Line first broke ground in 2017 and is not set to be completed until 2023. And the larger question of which this is a part is asking, um, you know, how do we move towards a right to suburbia, which is the tentative title of my larger book project, in which I'm asking, what does that mean to have a right to suburbia? This is David Harvey's famous quote, um, capturing the spirit of Henry Lefebvre um, to talk about what a right to the city really means, a right to change ourselves by changing the city that depends on the collective exercise of um, power to reshape processes of urbanization. But how can communities enact those rights? What is the role of planners in the process and, po and policymakers? And what lessons um, do we have from Langley Park and other case studies for advancing scholarship uh, and practice um, towards these equitable development goals in the context of suburbia? Um, so I'll end with um, some thoughts about rethinking uh, gentrification from the outside in and what some of those lessons from Langley Park might be. Um, and I offer here a picture from a recent protest in Langley Park around the um, recent rezoning that's gonna allow those TOD plans that I talked about earlier um, to raise densities in the community. First, I think we have to change the discourse and we have to displace um, the urban in our um, discourses about gentrification. Much of the scholarly focus um, and popular discourse of gentrification as if it can only happen in the city really limits our focus and our expanded geography um, to really be able to address some of the fundamental uh, policy questions and research questions about why um, and how place matters to the ways in which gentrification um, takes place. The other is to politicize um, the suburban retrofit. This question that I introduced at the beginning um, is, is um, largely the idea that much of the discourse about suburban retrofits and even um, smart growth has really um, made suburb, suburbs the cause celeb of new opportunities for densifying and making more walkable mixed use um, communities, but we have 
not necessarily put an equal focus on questions of growing inequalities um, and, and what that has meant for different communities. And so changing the rhetoric around there and asking a different set of questions will give us a different um, set of answers around the disparate consequences for marginalized groups and communities. And part of our job needs to be to show why place matters um, and how low income um, black and brown communities in Severia are facing a range of different challenges um, and attempting to remain in place and gain a more equitable share of the benefits of redevelopment. So here I've, I've listed a few of those challenges that I hope came through in the presentation about why place matters in terms of its spatial configuration, in terms of the community-based organizations um, and challenges to organizing and in, in terms of political representation um, or lack thereof and um, how suburban fragmentation really challenges that as well. But also how suburbs offer a kind of new possibilities for reframing um, our equitable development organizing strategies um, and building new possibilities for communities to stay in place. And so the Purple Line Corridor Coalition and the work of the, of the Fair Development Coalition I think gives us new tools to think about how we strengthen community capacity, build political will and new policy tools and bring more visibility to the struggles of low-income communities of color in the suburbs. And I'll just end by saying, I think that the, the mantra of organize, organize, organize is always one that we should be paying attention to. And I hope this presentation has shown you the effectiveness um, and also the challenges of doing so in suburbs. Thank you. Hi, thank you for, for the talk. I was wondering if you're taking any questions. Oh yes. yeah. Questions. Yeah. Sorry, it just took a second for me to get the screen up and running again. Um, but if folks have questions, um, they can go ahead and put them into the chat at this time. Or if you'd like to raise your hand um, using the raise your hand function, um, I can call on folks. Um, so if the person who just asked wants to ask the first question, um, please feel free. Oh, then my mute got <laughs> stuck. So, um, sure. Um, sorry, I think it's still muted. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Um, I I was wondering. Um, you had mentioned. Um, there, there was a point where the Purple Line, I think, Development Coalition and the FDC, um, they had worked on a document, a legal document that would have helped to protect the communities, but it was shut down by, or um, you know, not able to be enacted uh, because of the state government um, in charge. I was wondering if you know if that document, if that those legal um, activities were to take place, what kinds of um, things were they demanding or what, what restrictions were they putting on developers? Basically, what would have been the outcome if that was something that was able to, um, to, to take place? I think the critical difference between the, what was being called the Purple Line um, Compact at the time versus the Purple Line Community Development Agreement um, which is the current document that is the working document uh, for those two coalitions now is simply the mechanism of um, the legal ties, right? Um, it would have been a legally binding community benefits agreement. So when they establish goals for the preservation of affordable housing um, units, which the, the, co the coalitions have done, right now they're simply goals. They don't tie the counties nor the state to actually producing those units. Um, and so the coalitions 
have similar goals um, mm-hmm. between the two documents. It's just whether or not they're able to tie those to actual, um, to hold the counties and developers um, accountable for making those goals into reality. So right now the coalitions do a lot of fundraising, spend a lot of their time fundraising towards the achievement of those goals. They also spend a lot of time trying to work with the county agencies to commit funding towards those goals, but it's all voluntary. Um, And um, the other agreement would have put a lot more um, state Mm -hmm. dollars into the the mix and held everybody legally accountable to the goals. I see. Okay, thank you. Um, Joe, I see that you have your hand raised on Zoom. Do you wanna unmute and ask your question? Sure. Uh, thanks, Carolyn. Um, and thank you so much, Professor Long Island, for this talk. This was awesome. Um, I, I have a question about at the beginning, you showed t- the two other sites you're looking at uh, in Wheaton and Silver Spring. And I was wondering if I think you mentioned that the Wheaton case actually has some like positive lessons um, for Langley Park. And so I was wondering if you could just expand on 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 those other two cases and this sort of earlier wave of, of metro uh, oriented TOD and how the purple line might learn that from that and, 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 and sort of what you're finding in those other two cases. Yeah. Um, so actually the, the Langley park, I think is the most hopeful chapter in the book. Um, and I put it last in the book because it really is like in, t- in terms of time period, the, the last, um, you know, fight that took place amongst many of these Um, groups and a lot of them built their capacity along the way by learning the lessons and garnering new tools and each successive equitable development struggle. So so, um, Silver Spring was really one of the first where you have this massive um, county-led redevelopment process um, that really uses eminent domain very strongly, um, a lot of county dollars going into making redevelopment happening and just a huge loss of businesses without much protections. But what you also get out of that case is a new um, organization that's really fighting for a voice for marginalized groups at the table, um, trying to get them on redevelopment boards and um, finally putting some protections in place at the countywide level for small businesses. But that, you know, uh, the, those tools came a little bit too little too late and that they weren't really funded appropriately, they weren't getting down to businesses in timely fashion, and a lot was lost um, in terms of those businesses in Langley Park, and I'm sorry, in Silver Spring. In Wheaton, you have um, the county taking that same policy that was built in Langley and Silver Spring to be able to, to protect small businesses and really putting it um, in place in a larger fashion um, to be able to sort of get ahead of the curve. Um, And so you're also not working with a new organization that is being built for the first time, but you have an organization that is actually moving from the city to the suburbs um, and taking the capacity of that. um, They're organizing there to be able to work with small businesses more effectively. Um, And so the, Um, I think the lesson of those two cases is that you need to start early, you need to have the capacity amongst, um, you know, the um, nonprofit groups in order to be able to use these tools effectively, and you have to have political representation, because in each of the cases, um, the person who is forwarding these new policies that is making sure that all the, um, that all the regulations are in place to make sure they get to the people who need them most are, you know, the new, um, the first, the first and the onlys on the county um, councils and redevelopment boards um, in, in these um, locations. And in Langley Park, you have a lot of those same questions about, um, you know, whether the the capacity of the nonprofits are there, but you have a very high capacity nonprofit in uh, Casa de Maryland. Um, You have um, these questions being asked from the beginning of when the Purple Line is being built. So there's a little bit more time to build new tools and policies and a little bit more effective advocacy 
because you have these major anchor institutions and nonprofits that are building strong coalitions in order to make these tools happen. So while it's an imperfect case, it is probably the most um, promising of the three cases that I look at. Great, thank you. Our next question is from Marion, who, who says, thank you for an amazing presentation. I'm from Atlanta, where we have our own international corridor. Is there an organizing network for communities facing these kinds of challenges to learn from one another? Is that the Small Business Anti-Displacement Network? Thank you, Marion, for bringing up my other hat that I hold, which is um, as director of an organization known as the Small Business Anti-Displacement Network, which is focused on questions of small business displacement and the sort of lack of protections that we have at both the local and especially the national level for small businesses. While we um, have more protections in gentrifying neighborhoods for um, residences, and we have tools like inclusionary zoning, tenant opportunity of purchase, housing trust funds, things that I talked about in this pre um, presentation um, for uh, residents in many places, we don't have those protections for small businesses. And so part of the work of that um, organization um, that is just in its founding stages is to really build out some of those policy tools and lessons um, from places across the United States that are facing similar kinds of challenges. And one of the things that I've seen in suburbs is that because suburbs has such segregated land uses, it's not like these are mixed income mixed use neighborhoods to begin with, these are uh, transforming traditional or you know, low density downtowns into more mixed use and, um, communities. And so small businesses are often the ones who are most disparately impacted, um, which gave way to that work. But there, there are um, national organizations that are focused on issues of, um, of residential displacement um, and that are trying to build um, new tools. Um, the University of California at Berkeley runs the Urban Displacement Program uh, Project, which really focuses on policy tools that are working there um, to be able to um, stem residential displacement. Uh, policy Link runs a lot of um, national programs focused on anti-displacement in the residential space. And yes, we are trying to build that out for commercial anti-displacement at the national level as well. And I think we have time for one more question. I have a question actually. Um, I'm curious in terms of residential displacement, um, if you find that when folks are displaced from these inner suburbs that are gentrifying, if they tend to be displaced more to suburbs that are farther and farther out, or if they tend to be displaced to other inner suburbs that are still experiencing disinvestment and aren't gentrifying. That's a great question. Um, I don't, it's hard to really track where folks are going. Um, but one of the thing, one of the reasons why I wanted to write this um, book is because I felt like we had such an uncritical view of the kind of displacement um, that's happening in cities right now and why it matters. As if displacement to the suburbs could be, um, you know, an opportunity for communities where, um, you know, that have not historically been able to move to the suburbs. Well, that might be true, but suburbs also lack some of the vital resources that low-income communities and other marginalized communities need, right? It lacks the social connections, it lacks the community-based organizations and advocacy organizations, it lacks the policy tools, it lacks the transportation they need, it lacks the vital social networks that they've established in neighborhoods. So in my mind, displacement is never a good thing. Um, and, um, and the further and further marginalized communities are moved from the places that they have historically built power and built resources, the harder it is for them to gain um, a more equitable stake and a more sustainable um, place in their communities. And so I think it's important that we contextualize the kind of displacement that is happening 
and look at the resources that are available to communities in those places. And inner ring suburbs um, have, you know, one of the reasons why communities have been attracted to these communities when they, they are either pushed or pulled to suburbs, meaning they're displaced from urban neighborhoods or they decide to settle in, in them is because they have many of the vital resources that we want already in urban neighborhoods, right? Um, they are more dense, they are more walkable, they are more transit oriented, they are closer to jobs in the inner cities and the further they're displaced from those resources, the harder it is to access the kind of mobility and opportunity that we want. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, that is all the time that we have for questions, um, but on behalf of GSAP and the urban planning program in particular, um, I'd like to thank you again, Dr. Langamam, for your great presentation today. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your work with us, um, and thanks also to everyone who attended. Um, moving forward, we will not be holding lips for the next couple of weeks because of the Dean's Lecture by Teresa Caldera, as well as Election Day. Um, so make sure to join us on November 9th for our next lips, um, which will be by GSAP alumna Elizabeth Marcello, whose talk will be on the fight for transparent public authorities in New York State.